All right, I think we're ready to start. Thank you all for being here, joining us for an update of our plan to evolve the region's homelessness system. So we have accomplished a lot over the past year as we fundamentally shift how we transition people out of homelessness. That shift has occurred while we have simultaneously worked together to meet unexpected and constantly evolving pandemic needs with an eye towards strengthening our system for the long term. So today we're focused on our external regional partners that are transforming our approach to homelessness. Of course, as a city organization, the administration and the city council continue to work in close collaboration on operational execution, policy and financial considerations to be a good partner to so many in our region. So many thanks to our city council for its continued commitment and partnership on this issue. With me today, I'd like to introduce those to you, several people who have been very instrumental in making that shift and improving how we meet the needs of the most vulnerable in our community. Spokane County Commissioner Mary Cuny has been a partner with us at the regional table to make better use of regional homelessness assets. Mike Shaw, founder and CEO of the Guardians Foundation, has operated the Cannon Shelter behind me over the past seven months and has been a great partner as we have quickly met the pandemic needs of homeless men and women dating back to last spring. Major Ken Perrine of the Spokane Salvation Army has been another critical partner in meeting pandemic needs of homeless men and women over the past year and will play a crucial part in the next evolution of how we transition people out of homelessness. And finally, Fawn Schott, President and CEO of Volunteers of America, has been an outstanding leader in developing shelter and resources for women, youths, and young adults. So critical new pieces added since last summer are helping us fill identified gaps in the system. Those include engaging our providers to meet immediate system needs. We have worked with VOA to establish a temporary location for the young adult shelter and identify a preliminary permanent location. As a regional partnership, we've also added new assets to meet specialized needs and also better distribute resources. That includes expanding bed space for women and improving resources for youth experiencing homelessness. Improving our system responsiveness and strategically adding assets to better meet community needs. So we're announcing a competitive proposal process to select a year-round contract operator for the Cannon Homeless Service Center behind me this summer something we've never done before. We've established a temporary night-by-night -night location at Mission that is about to evolve into a resource-intensive bridge housing program, something we haven't done before. With the help of the Guardians Foundation, we've reintroduced the Cannon Shelter to the Browns Edition neighborhood as a model for connecting providers to the neighbors where they operate. We've also added flexibility to the shelter system during major weather events and other short-term environmental impacts. For example, adding more than 100 beds, low barrier flex beds to the system when needed. So those are changes that are taking place as part of a plan that I announced back in July. So it's great that we're here to update you and show you all the work that's been done. Shift to a year-round operator model at Canon begins this summer to end the ramp up every winter and the ramp down every spring. Introduce greater connectivity to services in our community. Establish day use here at the Canon location. Increase flexibility during times of inclement weather and other short-term environmental impacts. Target the delivery of services for greater personal accountability by establishing that intensive bridge housing program, which I mentioned, to move people into permanent housing. <clears throat> Identifying those who are ready to take the next step and connect them to intensive wraparound services. Creating a framework to continuously free up capacity in the shelter system by moving people into stable housing. Improving coordination between the city, service providers, and our partners, and to meet identified system gaps to keep homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring by establishing the young adult shelter 
to quickly meet the specific needs of 18 to 24 year olds. That's been identified as a missing gap or a gap that we need to fill. Partnering with Volunteers of America to operate that program through a Department of Commerce grant. We're evaluating a permanent location right now that is very close to public transportation and also technical training, very important to that age group. The goal is to locate the shelter away from downtown and the chronically homeless population that is there. The young adult shelter will meet the unique needs of 18 to 24 year olds and Crosswalk, also operated by VOA, will continue to focus on those under the age of 18. So County Commissioner Mary Cuny is being a big part of the growth of the regional partnership. I'd like to invite her to come up here and talk more about what we've been able to do in our work together. Mary? Well, thank you, Mayor Woodward. And I have to say, it's been your leadership that has brought us together on this issue and this topic. You know, because she has brought the city of Spokane, Spokane County, and the city of Spokane Valley together. So, and I want to say thank you to the service providers that are with us today as well. Homelessness is a regional challenge that requires all of us to commit to a goal of decreasing homelessness and maximizing the efficiency of our collective resources to be the best stewards of our taxpayer dollars. To do that, we are working closely together as a region. We are meeting regularly as a regional group to collaborate on system enhancements. The grant award for the youth shelter is a great example of team success. We secured an additional $500,000 in, in state funding to our community because we did it together instead of doing it individually. We invested in pandemic needs to minimize the spread of the illness and to prevent large outbreaks in the areas that would were part of our long-term system. Specifically, Spokane County dedicated federal CARES dollars into securing and improving the Way Out Shelter on mission to meet critical social distancing needs in the shelter system for the homeless adult men and women. This investment also makes it possible for our community to, bridge, to provide bridge housing and flexible homeless services in the future for all county residents. Improving the Cannon Shelter to meet critical social distancing needs for the homeless adult men and women and laying the groundwork for this new future 24-7 service. These investments were made to meet immediate needs. They were also a chance to provide better, to better prepare our region to transition people out of homelessness beyond the pandemic needs. It has taken all of us at the table to get this far and we are still working together to make even more improvements into the future. Our service provider partners are critical collaborators. And at this time, I would like to introduce Mike Shaw, founder and CEO of the Guardians Foundation, which has operated the Cannon Shelter 24 hours a day for the past seven months after stepping up last summer to meet urgent pandemic needs by operating the downtown library and the Spokane Arena. Thank you, Commissioner and everyone else behind me, it's an honor. It's an honor to work with you all. And it certainly is, it's an, wonderful to see the attention that the issue that our mayor is so passionate about resolving in her administration. The Cannon Shelter is an example of what a few dollars can produce. Uh, I have some off the cuff notes here. 828 unique individuals that's in a single individual, there's a few of us behind here, have utilized this shelter just since January. Now, you put that in perspective, 828 is the population of a small unincorporated town in our county or an outlying community in, this, in, in our neighborhoods. We've been able to establish 9,400 bed nights here and served over 28,000 meals. And our partnership with the Browns Edition community has been, quite frankly, a very unique situation when you can place a homeless shelter in a community where crime goes down and enthusiasm goes up, uh, participation in the neighborhood goes up. We're just very proud to, be, to set that example and the recognition for that. Last year, the city invested I think over a million dollars into this building and we've been very proud to be a good steward of this facility and uh, obviously anyone who wants to go in after this wraps up Jenna right over here in a vest we'd be happy to uh, 
walk you through the place. But I don't have much to say other than we are the front line of the front line of the front line. The people that walk up here need services and they need services now, this second. And we stand ready to do that. And we've been doing that and we continue to hope to continue to do that at this location. Uh, and for as long as we're ready to serve. And with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Major Ken, with the Salvation Army. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're very privileged to work with Mike and the Guardians out here. Uh, the Salvation Army, if you don't know, has been in uh, Spokane for uh, 130 plus years and around for 150 years. And we're privileged to work with, uh, with the community in different um, spheres, whether it be youth or children or uh, adults and seniors, and also the homeless. So very, very privileged to do that. And throughout the pandemic, we, we've been working through with Spokane County, City of Spokane, and uh, Got to say, I absolutely love our mayor and I uh, love our uh, our city council and our, uh, our our county council. It's just amazing. So, but uh, we've been working with them to provide a safe place for people to sleep, shower, use the restroom, charge their devices, get a meal, while also connecting dozens to unemployment and housing. Uh, and I just want to say we're making this exciting transition from a night-by-night -night shelter into an intensive bridge housing type program, which um, we've been doing already with the folks that have been coming to us. So uh, I'd love to tell you about stats and numbers, but I just want a quick story. We had a person come to us who used to be an uh, electrical contractor. He was living in the back, somebody's backyard, got kicked out of there, had some drug issues. But you know, with our staff, they helped him get back on his feet, helped him get back his license to help him get a job. And that's what bridge housing is all about. And so we're really not about housing people for the sake of housing them. The bridge shelter is about housing them, about moving them forward. And that's what we're about. So coming uh, in uh, in June, we're gonna be transitioning to remodel the, the way out shelter uh, to make it a bridge housing shelter. And uh, we're gonna get people into substance abuse, uh, do some interviews with them, uh, substance abuse prevention, and then work with them getting a job and getting regular housing. That's what we're about. Uh, you know what, it's not just us, you know, the, this, this uh, issue, work with, with homeless is not just about the Salvation Army, it's about all of us as agencies and a city and a community working together. And I just want to introduce uh, Fawn uh, Schott from the President of CEO and uh, of Volunteers of America, and uh, she's got even more to say. Great, thank you Major Ken, and thank you to all of our provider and uh, Mayor Woodward and Commissioner Cooney for their regional support. This has been um, untapped um, resource to be able to address homelessness and help people move into um, permanent housing and get the resources that they need. The past month has been incredibly exciting for Volunteers of America. We opened our new Hope House Women's Shelter, doubling our capacity and allowing us to double the number of women who move into permanent housing every single year. Uh, additionally, we had 60 apartments for individuals experiencing homelessness with a disability and many of those shelter guests at Hope House as well as our other shelters across the community have moved into those 60 units and will continue to move there through the next month. We also added, um, and we, in, in partnership, we added um, a young adult shelter with Women's Hearth is a temporary location in the downtown core, working with our regional partners to find a permanent location for this young adult shelter out of the downtown core and near educational opportunities and transportation, ending their pathway to chronically homeless. We're also advancing our crosswalk programs for young people under the age of 18 because they deserve a better life and a better opportunity to become successful adults in our community. Creating pathways for young adults who are between the ages of 18 and 24 to exit homelessness quickly is a prevention strategy to make sure we end chronically homeless adult um, it, uh, end chronically homelessness for adults in our community. We meet the unique needs of the young adults by, who are experiencing this by providing them the opportunity to get off the streets, get into housing quickly, find employment and education that ends the cycle of homelessness forever. Early in intervention means a new life for these individuals and reduces the long-term impact of homelessness on our community and our regional system. VOA is really excited to be part of a regional approach 
that addresses and resolves homelessness. And we're here for the long haul to make sure that people have a safe and stable place to go. We're also making major advancements in our Crosswalk Teen Shelter program, which addresses homelessness for young people ages 13 to 18. Those kids need us to commit to them and to provide them opportunities because they haven't had them in their life. Crosswalk is an early chance to redirect them into education, livable wage jobs, so they no longer need to use the systems that are provided for the resources in our community. VOA is excited to be part of this solution in addressing homelessness in our community, and we thank everybody for the opportunity to support and serve individuals. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Woodward for her final thoughts. Mayor Woodward. Thank you, Fawn, and to all of our partners here today. The success of the system relies on everyone that are who are here today and many, many others. That includes the city's community housing and human services department staff. They work tirelessly behind the scenes to support the needs of our partners and the most vulnerable in our community. The pandemic has made their already very difficult job even more challenging. So a big thank you to them for their expertise and professionalism as they have pushed for our community. Before we take questions, I do wanna cover two things very, very quickly. First, the most recent point in time count, which was conducted in January in a modified fashion because of the health pandemic, found that the number of those seeking emergency shelter has steadily increased since 2013. It concluded that instead of increasing inventory, making investments in improved placement rates and performance leads to more people exiting homelessness. So this has been our focus on the announcements that we're making today. Statewide and nationally, homelessness is increasing. At 992, the number of people counted in Spokane County as sheltered during this year's point in time count remain relatively flat compared to the previous four years. The point in time count also typically involves a count of the unsheltered population as well. But as a result of pandemic restrictions, they were in place that were in place in January, data on unsheltered homeless was not collected this year. The point in time count is one way to collect data. Based on the count and other data gathered throughout the year, we are taking an outcome based approach. So finally, the city has identified some immediate steps to improve the environment for all who use downtown and our community. The pandemic impacted many of the measures that were previously in place and the expected reopening of our economy, which I hope is very soon, could help accelerate the immediate actions. And I'm gonna run down those actions for you right now. Enhancing the city's cleanup resources by expanding litter and graffiti crews. We are adding more hours, weekend coverage, and doubling the amount of employees dedicated to litter and graffiti cleanup to create four crews. A three-person graffiti abatement team to respond to complaints and proactively monitor graffiti hotspots. A five-person downtown maintenance team to work directly with the downtown police precinct to respond to reports of illegal camping and regular cleaning of hot spots. A four-person neighborhood unlawful encampment team to work as part of our existing pod team outside of the downtown area. A four-person litter control crew to provide general code enforcement and illegal dumping abatement in the public right-of-ways. We're adding a second four-person so one will support the unlawful encampment teams, the other will support the litter crew and code enforcement operation. We're adding a manager to oversee the operation of these four crews, schedule responses, and monitor status and completion. And we're also working to bring back Geiger crews to assist with our cleanup efforts. We lost those crews almost entirely during the COVID pandemic. We're adding a dozen secure public garbage cans to the downtown core for additional disposal and containment of litter. We're reopening public restrooms in the downtown core that have been closed as part of the pandemic response. We're collaborating with the Downtown Spokane Partnership to clean up human waste in public places. We're piloting an alleyway activation partnership 
with DSP and Spokane Arts to offer additional clean spaces for businesses and the public to use. In fact, right now, we're working on the alleyway between Washington and Stevens and Maine and Riverside. We're piloting a cleanup program focused on the Brown Street Viaduct, and we're partnering with Catholic Charities to do that. We're working with shelter service providers to facilitate continued open communication with neighbors to minimize neighborhood impactment. And we're increasing awareness of the hours of intake at shelter system locations. A lot of work has been done. We have a lot of work to do. So thank you for listening to us today. This global pandemic threw a lot of challenges our way. And as a region, we met them and we found long-term opportunities to improve our homeless system and our approach to addressing this issue. So I am grateful for all the work that we have done with the partners behind me. So if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Can you release the results of the point time count today? I'm not sure if it's today, but that will be released at some point. So its conclusion was that more capacity is not necessary, this is better. So the Homelessness has increased, therefore more capacity is not necessary? Our, our sheltered has remained flat. Our sheltered population has remained flat. But the conclusion was that if we utilize the existing capacity in a better way, as we're announcing today, that's the way to approach it. That's the way to get more people to exit homelessness. How can that be inferred when there was no count of the unsheltered population? That's what they came up with. That's the recommendation. Who's, who made this recommendation? That was our CHHS staff. Okay. So this is Cupid and New. Was, was TJ a part of this or was this Blue Chief? This is the existing staff now. Okay. Is one of my questions is is, is you and uh you kind of mentioned this at the beginning, but you've been really, really proud and one of your big goals as mayor is working with city council. Um, I, I noticed that I mean city council isn't uh, here today. They said they weren't invited to the press conference. This is held during their, their Thursday, um, the existing Thursday meeting, and they weren't aware of any changes. Why the, it's, that seems different from how it's usually operated. Why the change? Well, we're collaborating continuously with City Council, and I'm very, very thankful for their support. This event was to focus on our external partners. Um, I'm the only one here representing the city for this announcement. And we continue, uh, we look forward to continued support for them on all the things that we laid out today. Was the, was the council involved in, in this specific discussion or was this, was this something that they're going to be learning about too today? Uh, we have ongoing discussions with council regularly. Yeah, so I know you have ongoing discussions, but this specifically, is this new to council today? And they know some of it might be, some of it might not be. Yeah, well, we are in con continuous conversation. You know, I meet with the council president every week. Yeah. And so these are all things, a lot of these things that we've talked with him about. Yeah, yeah, this so the, the majority of the big items were discussed in a, a study or a um, committee meeting on the The um, and these are also operational things. These are things that I'm I'm charged with doing, Daniel. So so that's why I'm here today. Is um, is Catholic Charities involved with this? I, I mentioned Catholic Charities in this. Yeah, we're piloting with them on the uh, cleanup of the Browns Viaduct, Brown Street Viaduct. Yeah. Uh, can you have a question as well? Uh, Mayor, the year-round use of the, uh, the Cannon Street Center, is that a, or can you explain more of the contract with the Guardian? Is that a permanent contract or how, how will that be handled? The gar contract, the existing contract with the Guardians is going to be expanded for 90 days while we put out an RFP uh, for a, uh, an operator uh, to, to operate the shelter year-round. So they will continue to be here through uh, for 90 more days after June 30th. And then we'll we'll have a, another operator, probably first of October. So will they then be the permanent? Operator? Well, the RFP is a process that engages many many providers. So we'll see who that is. We don't know who that is right now. Yeah. But let me just say, Guardians have done an incredible job. I don't know if you know this, but their engagement with the neighborhood, the Browns Edition neighborhood, that neighborhood council came up with a resolution and took it to the city that talked about what a great job that they did in the last seven months operating the shelter. Oh. Rebecca, I'm sorry, I can't hear you at all. <laughs> Oh, 
The, uh, when it reopens, there'll be fewer beds for those who are looking for uh, stabilization and services, but we're also uh, providing beds in the basement as well. So um, there should be 60 beds when it becomes a bridge housing, and we could fit as many as uh, 50 people in, in the basement. So all that work starts right after June 30th. Well, it could be three to four months out. So when we get a new operator at Cannon, then uh, we're hoping to simultaneously reopen the shelter on mission as that bridge housing shelter. What, what happens to the, this, this might be something, something you've already answered and I just, just missed it, but what happens to the 100 or so people that were, at, were staying at the way out shelter in that 60 to 90 days that you guys are going to work? We were finding space within the system to, to accommodate them. Yep. We don't have anything announced, ready to announce quite yet, but we will, we will soon. Will this avoid, I mean, having this be kind of a year-round operator, will this avoid the, are we going to have the warming center crisis like we've had? No, and as I mentioned in, in my announcement, we're going to avoid the, the scramble to ramp up and then to ramp down. So we'll be able to pivot very, very quickly with one operator here year-round, depending really on the season or on the weather and how the weather is that season. So yeah, it's going to provide much more flexibility than we've ever had here. And it's really hard to find a part-time operator. Most providers want to be able to work year-round. So that's been a challenge too in the past. We won't, we won't have that. Are we going to have warming centers at all or is it just going to be the shelter? Boy, I can't predict that. It depends on, you know, on, the, on the weather. Uh, I, I imagine we probably will. And we've been, we've been able to show flexibility just in this last uh, winter season with hoteling. I mean, that, that was a successful option. So we'll, we'll see when, when the weather arrives. I believe there's going to be some work, possibly. No, we're done? Okay, we're done with that. Potentially, depending on the applicant, the selected applicant may have some, some minor things, but most of the major work has been done. I had a question for Mike real quick. Okay, yeah. Please. Um, just one of the things, Mike, is, it is as we've talked about before, you know, the, the, when the Guardians first started operating the shelter, there was a pretty rough, rough first couple of months at kind of getting your, your your bearings right. I guess I'm wondering, is there anything you've learned or anything you've changed to allow this one to be successful in ways that the, kind of the first go around may have, may have not been? Well, our first go around was uh, was difficult for a number of reasons. One's we were asked to operate almost fi five shelters at the time. So we had five locations that we were operating. Uh, two, I think, I think a lot of people learned a lot about what was going on in the systems, not only about the Guardians Foundation's capabilities, but also the urgency that 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 a, that, a, that, a, that an organization with characters saves the city a lot of money. So when you want to reflect back to our, you know the the that season, I, I would I would clearly state that uh, an organization with characters is, is an important piece when choosing RFPs, and as well as uh, uh, but as far as we learn something every day, uh, I'm about to learn something here when I walk into my shelter in the next 15 minutes. But that's a great uh, conversation. We we believe that. Uh, that uh, basic stuff, honesty, and taking care of the individuals that were right in front of our faces, and keeping our nose to the grindstone, and staying out of the uh, the politics, and doing the job at hand, that that's the that's the best way to get the results for our taxpayers. Any more I have I have another for for the mayor. If she's if she's uh, I don't mean to ping pong you back and forth. I just want to make sure. So uh, obviously the housing is, is a really big piece of the homelessness challenge. Um, there had been a, a pilot project uh, at the end of the Conn administration, there have been discussions about a pilot project that was looking, that would have looked at um, increasing the, the, the density of the zoning in the uh, Monroe and Perry neighborhoods, kind of a pilot project there. What ended up happening with that? Well, that's a good question. I can take that for Okay, yeah, and I, and I, sorry, I just hadn't heard yeah. from you, and I thought you might know, but. So I guess more generally, what's, what's gonna be your key or your strategy to, to deal with the, with the oncoming housing crisis? Well, we're gonna have an announcement uh, very, very soon on that. We're working out the details right now. We've got a number of things that we're gonna be rolling out. I'm, I'm not gonna tell, talk about them uh, at this point, but I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that with you very soon. Do we have a planning director? Like, when are we gonna get a planning director? Hopefully, <laughs> I wish we got one yesterday, but we wanna make sure we get the right person and so um, we are recruiting uh, once again for a, for a planning director. What's the biggest thing you've learned about homelessness in the past year? 
or so? Well, I mean, th this last year has been so different than any other year. I mean, I, I you know, I, I think w the region has done an incredible job of responding to the homeless needs during a global health pandemic. I and mean, we sheltered, we sheltered homeless and expanded uh, our capacity uh, throughout throughout 2020 and, in, and, and into 2021. That's something we've never done before, been able to do year round. I'm, I'm proud of, of the collaboration that we have with our partners behind me, with the county and the valley as we sit at the table and we have these discussions. But, and, then, and then we've been able to announce all of these things in addition to that. I think it's pretty remarkable to be able to say this after a year and a half. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I know some want to get through the, the, the shelter itself. Mr. Shaw's made a range to take, take the tour and the tour if you'd like to go through. So we'll do that now. We'll be able to go to the large community if you'd like to stay. Mr. Shaw here will direct you to the person to take you through.